We're going to begin by reviewing some of the codes and requirements for safely supporting excavation. And I'm referring here to 29 CFR, which is the federal code for this kind of work. Now, if you did a search on 29 CFR, you'd see that there are volumes of uh, material available and commentary on this code. So I have tried to somehow boil this down to just two rules. And I think that this is at least an effective summary of what is included in the code. The first rule says excavations over five feet must be supported. And this is uh, helpful and useful because there's no ambiguity here. If you're excavating deeper than five feet, you must support the sides. However, this is also misinterpreted to mean that if the excavation is less than five feet deep, no supports are required. Uh, that is a mistake and can lead to real difficulties. The depth of excavation is only one consideration. The nature of the soil is probably uh, more important and more of a determining factor. If the soil is cohesive, five feet might be just fine. If the soil is not cohesive and a kind of a running flowing soil, there may be no depth at which that can be safely excavated without supporting the sides. The other consideration which is very important is the presence or absence of live loads. Any excavation which is subjected to live loads needs to be supported. And on a construction site, it's uh, hard to predict where the construction equipment will be and you really need to be conservative and assume that at some time or another the construction equipment will be right at the edge of the excavation reaching inside raising or lowering material and you need to design with uh, that potential live load in mind. Rule number two is supervision by a competent party. Uh, it would be wonderful if every activity on a construction site was supervised by a competent party, but nowhere is that more important than in creating a safe support for excavations. You really need some experienced people, and if they're experienced with the local soil conditions, so much the better. So this is not a place for someone who's just beginning the learning curve. You really need some knowledgeable, experienced help here. Now I'm suggesting a new rule that all excavations subject to live load must be supported. I think that is much safer and really describes and anticipates the conditions on a construction site. Here we have one of the simplest, most direct devices for support of excavation. This is a portable box, that blue structure. You can excavate a rather crude uh, opening, lower this box in place, you can continue to excavate inside the box to get it to the grade that you want. And the ends of the box are open so you can advance lengths of pipe or whatever it is you're trying to uh, install. So you've quickly created a very safe environment. No special tools are required. The same backhoe that excavated the trench can handle this box as well. Now there are some shortcomings here and first of all you can see it requires quite a bit of space so you are unlikely to ever see one of these in some downtown street but also it 
has to be an area which is free of utilities. Now, if you're new to this business, you may not have heard much discussion about utilities, but on any construction project, they are extremely important and need to be well understood and accounted for before construction gets underway. Very often they are neglected and they come back to really haunt you during construction. Now this box needs to have an environment that is free of utilities in order to work. So in a downtown location like this, because of space limitations, because of utilities, the box really would be infeasible. Now this location is quite typical. This happens to be in lower Manhattan. The excavated trench is filled with utilities. And by the way, these are only up near the surface, you can expect that there would be many more utilities, gas mains, water mains, and sewers that would exist farther down in the excavation. If you're designing a project, you need to carefully assess what utilities are in the area and how they are going to be relocated or otherwise accommodated. You need to do as careful a job as possible, and when questions arise, the use of test pits are a very effective way of gathering more information so that you have anticipated, to the extent possible, the impact of utilities. Now, you can be quite sure there will still be surprises during construction, but the idea is to minimize those surprises because each uncovered utility, which is uh, not anticipated, will result in delays, additional costs, uh, possibly disputes over who pays for these unidentified utilities. So this is an area which is often uh, put on the back shelf and really belongs in the forefront of any design effort. Here is a system that you have all seen out in the street. This is very, very typical, and this is called timber sheeting. This is an extremely versatile method, and while it may look uh, somewhat uh, thrown together, it's not. It's extremely sturdy and safe, and for, you know, reasonably shallow excavations, it is uh, not only a satisfactory solution, but it is a very flexible and very helpful solution. And that's why you've seen it so often. I just want to identify some of the features. This is a whaler. That's a continuation of the whaler. So a member like this, a horizontal member, which is uh, uh, supporting the sheeting. In, in this case, the vertical sheeting are timbers. This horizontal member is called a whaler, and the vertical members in this case are timber sheets or timber planks. Here's a second whaler, so this could be uh, the, the whaler at level two. And as you go farther down in the trench, you meet, may need a third whaler. What's very interesting here is how nicely the timber sheets can be cut around existing utilities. And this is a very, very helpful method because it works very, very well with existing utilities. Some other features here, the timber planks are extended, at least uh, here and there, so that you can attach a uh, railing to them to provide some security. Here's a ladder, which offers quick uh, egress to the excavation. These are very, very important 
uh, safety features. This looks like a length of uh, suction hose so that any water that is uh, accumulating inside the trench can be pumped away. Here I've enlarged an area of the same sheeted trench to show you the connection between two of the vertical planks. If you're not familiar with that shape, it's called tongue and groove. And it is a very tight way of joining two uh, wood shapes. Now you would typically find this in uh, cabinet construction or some uh, fine furniture construction. So what is it doing out here in the middle of the street? In this particular project, Many of the excavations are carried down to the water table and sometimes uh, slightly below the water table. The water table is relatively high. And this tongue and groove connection can give you a quite a watertight uh, perimeter. A certain amount of water will certainly find its way in, but that is easily uh, connected in a sump and pumped away. So this is a very, very uh, good feature and makes timber sheeting even more effective. This is the same trench, which has now been continued below the existing pipe. You can see it's a very dry environment. And I'll just uh, go through and identify some of the members again. This is a horizontal whaler continuation of that horizontal whaler. This is a lower level whaler. Continued here along this face. And here we have something new. This is an intermediate brace. Obviously this whaler can only span a limited distance at which time you need to introduce a brace. And this is an interesting design problem. You want to make that whaler as heavy as possible in order to minimize the number of braces. The braces will interfere with whatever work you're trying to do. If you're trying to reach in and excavate or deliver lengths of pipe or whatever activities you have, the braces or struts will be in the way. So it's good practice to make the whalers strong enough in order to minimize the number of braces and give you the largest clear opening to do your work. Here's a different project. Also timber sheeting. This is uh, quite a deep excavation, but you can see that the trench is relatively dry. And here the members are even larger than in the previous installation. So here's the upper whaler, a very substantial timber. And here's the brace or the strut. Here's the next one, quite some distance away. So this achieves the maximum amount of working space, which is certainly your goal. I want to point out another feature here. This plank has been attached to the strut and it's not carrying any load. It's simply just carrying the weight of the strut, but it's very effective. After the excavation reaches this point, the wells are installed, and then the struts are dropped in place. Now you can simply drop them in because they're supported by this top plate that you've added. It is necessary to come back and shim the space to make sure you have a very tight fit. The goal is always to minimize any movement to the sheeting because any movement would result in settlement outside the sheeting. And this is what you're trying to minimize or eliminate. You do this by ensuring an absolutely tight fit at the end of the struts. And you can fill out that space with 
shims and then eventually with uh, tapered shims which are driven to get a tight fit. But nevertheless everything here is timber and you would expect a support system of this sort to yield somewhat, deflect somewhat, and it would be a mistake to think that there would be absolutely no settlement outside the sheeting. So this is a perfectly safe and satisfactory solution, but you need to be prepared to tolerate some settlement on the outside of the sheeting.